na maior manifestação política já registrada em São Paulo. Hundreds of thousands of protesters across Brazil. For weeks, Brazil has been consumed by allegations of corruption at the highest level. Leitura de processo de impeachment contra a presidente Dilma Rousseff. The leftist leader is being blamed as Operation Car Wash nears her inner circle. Hello, I'm Barbara Serra, and you're at The Listening Post. These are some of the stories we're looking at this week. The pressure ramps up on the streets and in the media against embattled Brazilian president, Gilma Rousseff. In South Africa, a complex relationship between the Zuma government and news outlets in the country. And he may be getting more coverage than anyone else in the U.S. election race, but Donald Trump definitely does not like the media. They are the worst. In the past week, Brazilians have had wall-to-wall -wall coverage of a political scandal threatening to bring down the country's government. Last Sunday, more than a million people demanded the removal and impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff. It was the latest development in a two-year-long story, an investigation called Operação Lava Jato, Operation Car Wash. The investigation centers on a billion-dollar corruption scandal at Brazil's mammoth oil corporation, Petrobras. The scandal has touched many of President Rousseff's close associates. Operação Lava Jato has dominated the news in Brazil and has brought the biases of the mainstream media starkly into view. Rousseff is the second successive left-wing president to be elected in Brazil, and she and her workers' party complained that they've been in the crosshairs of a mainstream media monopolized by right-wing conglomerates. The corruption story has not made life easy for the Rousseff government. It's battling waves of negative Reporting. However, for many watching the news, well, there is a suspicion that the coverage has just as much to do with pushing the political divide as it has to do with the corruption scandal. The Listening Post's Marcela Pizarro now on the role the media is playing in Brazil's political crisis. On Sunday the 13th of March, Brazil's largest broadcaster, TV Globo, suspended its regular programming to cover protests across the country. The media had spent a lot of airtime in the run-up, urging people to take to the streets to demand the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff. Rousseff isn't under investigation herself. Who turns up to protests says a lot about Brazilian politics, society, and its media. The demographic profile of people who went to the streets uh, last Sunday is very particular. They're like upper middle class, white. They're from the southeastern part of Brazil, I mean, the richest part of Brazil. So, you know, there is this bunch of very discontent white middle class folks who do not like the Workers' Party from the beginning, I guess. And the sentiment has been fed uh, and also augmented or increased by the media. And there was one photograph that went viral on Brazilian media that was absolutely outstanding. It was this middle-aged, middle-class couple going to the demonstrations, and right behind them there was the nanny push priming the toddlers. And that's it. You know, you can protest, you can drink. There are a lot of people drinking champagne at this huge... Uh, it was a bit of a, a demonstration carnival. But she has to go there to take care of the toddlers, even in the middle of the demonstration. So this, in a nutshell, is the portrait of Brazilian society. If you don't understand that, you don't understand nothing that's going on at the moment. Brazil is a country of 200 million. Its deep social divides have been at the heart of national politics. For over a decade, the left-wing Workers' Party, led by former President Lula da Silva, oversaw a period of significant economic and social change. The media system, however, remained remarkably untouched. Five families, amongst the richest in Brazil, control 70% of the mainstream media. Rubo Globo, owned by the Marinos, runs the TV Globo network. The Cevita family owns Grupo Avril. That publishes Brazil's most read news weekly, Veja. Grupo Folha is owned by the Frias family. The Sards own Grupo Bandeirantes, and the Macedos own Grupo Records. All five families have been part of the Brazilian establishment, the ruling class, for decades. Neither Lula nor Rousseff pushed for diversity of ownership in the media landscape. The big media houses have remained unmoved. There is a sense that a lot of the media owners have not been capable of living with change, as if they feel too threatened with everything that's happening. Any type of uh, 
ideology which can be perceived as being more progressive is instantly put down, instantly criticized. What the current political crisis does is intensify people's emotions. The country splits into two very clear groups and the debate becomes insane. This is a very serious problem. The traditional media has started to become a target of the current animosity. Even if you can identify a particular political leaning in one news outlet or another, the other side's viewpoint will never be omitted. This would never happen as it does on social media, because the press is committed to listening to all sides. Corruption is not a new story in Brazil. However, no investigation has been as big as Operation Car Wash. At the center of the scandal is the oil behemoth Petrobras. Its executives are accused of taking bribes and making illicit political donations. President Rousseff was head of the corporation between 2003 and 2010. She'd been cleared of any wrongdoing, but more than 30 members of her government are under scrutiny, including her mentor and predecessor, Lula da Silva. This is a big story, meriting aggressive coverage, but news outlets have been spurred on further by the head of the investigation, the media savvy judge, Sergio Moro. It would seem as though Moro's media strategy was set out a decade ago, before Operation Car Wash even began. In 2004, he wrote an article about another investigation in Italy called Mani Bolite, or Clean Hands. That campaign's success, wrote Moro, was rooted in how investigators used the media to intoxicate the political atmosphere. In that particular piece, his idea is that the media has to be used or has to work together with the judiciary against the government to discredit the government. So that would be the only way to actually get hold of the corrupt politicians and put them in jail. These investigations are supposedly secret, you know, but they are always leaked and the media actually accuse many people beforehand, before the investigation is concluded. So these people have their reputations thrown into the garbage. They're tried by the public opinion way before, you know, they have an actual trial. Why are there so many leaks? Well, this is a typically Brazilian way of conducting these things. There is always a back door, a leak. What we do is to produce coverage that is the most accurate, in the sense that we don't prejudge. There is an opinion section in the newspaper that's reserved to showing the newspaper's views, but to us, who work with journalistic coverage, we limit our reporting to the facts. Not everyone agrees with that assessment. Over the past two years, the news magazines Veja and Eboca have been criticized for their thinly sourced reporting on this story. Alex Cuadros, a journalist based in Sao Paulo, wrote a lengthy piece accusing the two magazines of resorting to vague implications and providing no documentary evidence. And during an evening bulletin on TV Globo this month, protesters stood behind one correspondent holding signs that read, Global wants to incite a coup, it wants to burn the country what people have become more um, conscious about is the ways in which sectors of the media are trying to make political advantage of this issue and thus force an impeachment, force a type of soft coup now through the justice system. It's very shoddy journalism because there's no proof, it's just innuendo. For the developing world, this is one of the most important stories of the past few years and for the foreseeable future. Because it's a corruption war, it's a political economic crisis mixed with an information war at the same time. So everybody has to pay attention. Other media stories on our radar this week. In the United States, journalists covering Donald Trump's campaign for the Republican nomination have complained about being targeted verbally at his rallies. Now the confrontations are getting physical. In a span of three weeks, at least three journalists have documented being roughed up while covering Trump events. CBS News' Sopan Deb was briefly arrested as he covered clashes between protesters and Trump supporters in Chicago. Late in February, photojournalist Christopher Morris was shoved to the ground by a Secret Service agent for stepping out of the media holding area at a Trump rally. The confrontation that has generated the most reaction, however, is this one that took place at the beginning of March. That was insane. You should have felt how hard he grabbed me. 
The recording is of Michelle Fields, a journalist working with the conservative news site Breitbart. She said Trump's campaign manager forcefully pushed her when she asked a question. Other journalists on the scene confirmed Fields' story, but Breitbart itself is not backing its reporter. Six members of staff have resigned from the site in protest against the lack of support for Fields and what they say is a pro-Trump bias. Two Australian journalists have been deported and a leading news site has shut down in Malaysia as media investigations into allegations of corruption against Prime Minister Najib Razak have intensified. The Malaysian Insider published its final post at midnight on Monday, 14th of March. The editor, Jahabar Sadiq, cited commercial reasons, but in an article published in the UK's Guardian, he wrote, the threat of being accused of sedition and possible jail time has imprisoned us within our minds as Malaysians. People are shutting up and we have shut down. The government had blocked access to the website within Malaysia since last month after it reported in depth on the story of state investment funds being allegedly siphoned off into Prime Minister Razak's personal bank account. Uh, hello, Mr. Prime Minister. It's ABC Australia. I'm wondering if you can explain... On March 12th, two journalists working for the Australian public broadcaster ABC were briefly arrested after trying to question the Prime Minister over the corruption claims. The two were released without charges and have since left the country. Israeli authorities are using new anti-terror measures approved by the government just last week to clamp down on Palestinian media. On March 11th, Israeli forces stormed the offices of Palestine Today, a TV station based in Ramallah in the occupied West Bank, arresting three members of staff and confiscating their equipment. Israel accuses the channel of broadcasting inflammatory material and encouraging Palestinians to attack Israelis. They also say the channel is the media arm of Islamic Jihad, a Palestinian political movement outlawed in Israel. Another TV station, Hamas-run Al-Aqsa TV, has been dropped by French satellite giant Utelsat after a formal request from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Al-Aqsa TV says it will continue broadcasting on a new satellite frequency. A few weeks back, we aired a report on transformation, the extent of racial integration in South Africa's news media since the end of apartheid. This week, we're going back there to look at the relationship between President Jacob Zuma, his government, and the media. Zuma generates a lot of bad press in South Africa, from the state of the economy to the broadsides against his leadership and even the controversial $20 million upgrade of his private homestead. But Zuma isn't without his allies in the media. There is the state-owned South African broadcast Broadcasting Corporation, the SABC, the most influential news outlet in the country, which is frequently accused of pro-government bias. His close relationship with the influential business family, the Guptas, translates into friendly coverage in the outlets they own. And then there's the Independent Media Group, which critics say doesn't necessarily report favorably on the president as much as it goes after the main opposition group, the Democratic Alliance. These are tense times under Zuma's presidency, race relations are still fraught, corruption is rife, and the local elections that are just around the corner will be a test of the ruling African National Congress Party's appeal, which shows signs of waning. For the president, now more than ever, controlling the message is essential. The Listening Post, Nick Muirhead, reports from Cape Town. What do a uranium plant, South Africa's state airline, the SAA, a newspaper called The New Age, and the country's president, Jacob Zuma, all have in common? The answer is that they can all be linked to a wealthy business family in South Africa, the Guptas, and the New Age newspaper, which they own. The Gupta family is a very influential family in South African politics. They arrived in South Africa in 1994 and they created a series of relationships with very prominent individuals, a very personal relationship with President Jacob Zuma. Now when the Gupta family launched its media company in 2010, they were unequivocal in stating that this paper would be pro-government. It seems like that's a quid quo, quo. I mean, that's the most logical way to read it. That we'll get lots of tenders, but in return we'll have media that is sympathetic to the ANC and to the president. And the most obvious case 
is now that President Zuma is being talking about a nuclear energy contract with the Russians, which is very contentious in South Africa. And yet the Guptas seem to be extraordinarily well positioned and suddenly are owners of uranium deposits and uranium mines in South Africa. The other obvious sign of the connection between government and the Gupta media empire is that the newspaper, The New Age, which is a tiny circulation, and yet it's, it's available free on the state airline. The SAA is in financial trouble. In the 2013-14 financial year, it reported a $163 million loss, but over a recent four-year period, it spent $900,000 buying copies of The New Age newspaper. Then there's what the government spends on advertising in the paper. Between 2013 and 2014, it was more than $670,000, which is almost exactly what it spent at a much bigger paper, the Sowetan, which reportedly has 10 times the readership. And there's another state-funded money spinner for the paper. It organizes something called business breakfasts, which are aired on the state-owned broadcast of the SABC for free. State-owned institutions often sponsor the events, but the money, roughly a million dollars a year, doesn't go to the SABC, it goes to the New Age newspaper. These breakfast briefings take place, it's hosted by the New Age, it's broadcasted on the SABC, and it's sponsored by a third party. That third party is usually state-owned entities. And today, uh, we want to say thank you to uh, Transnet, uh, because with their support, that's why you've got all this lovely food on your tables today instead of just bread and water. The controversy so, Jasmine, is in an economy indeed. that's struggling, in an environment where state-owned entities are not able to meet their mandates, they are spending that amount of money in hosting politicians and in hosting government so, so. departments. You must not say mangaung, you must say mangaung. <laughs> and the question always was, why then does the SABC have to have these breakfast briefings with the New Age attached to it? And it's very lucrative for the New Age as well. The Gupta family identified a gap and they did not do it secretly. They told everyone when they launched this publication five years ago that they were going to report favorably on government. At least to their credit, they were honest. Juxtapose that with these so-called independent media that claim to be unbiased and objective when they know exactly where their political allegiance lies. ANC supporters frequently accuse the privately owned media, the newspapers, of serving as the unelected opposition in South Africa. The papers are seen to back opposition leaders like Musi Mayamani and Helen Ziller by attacking the ANC relentlessly. In 2009, the main opposition group in South Africa, the Democratic Alliance, or DA, took control of the Western Cape in the general election. It was the first time the ruling ANC party had lost control of the province since coming into power, and it's been losing ground to the DA ever since. In May, South Africans head back to the polls in local elections, and there's a feeling here in Cape Town that the ANC is trying to put the DA on the defensive in its own backyard, and that the media is doing the ANC's dirty work. In 2013, the independent media group, which owns the Cape Times and the Cape Argus, two popular dailies in the province, got a new owner, Secongelo Investment Holdings. Founded by Dr. Iqbal Survey, who once served as Nelson Mandela's physician, the company has close ties to the ruling ANC party. The takeover of the newspapers was largely financed by the government pension fund, and observers have noticed a change in the editorial stance of the independent newspapers. There's definitely been an attempt to reorientate the editorial agenda at independent newspapers. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, one could well argue that it adds to media diversity in South Africa. I mean, before the takeover, we had four large corporations that largely had the same editorial perspective on society. Of course, in a democracy, there should be multiple editorial agendas and diverse ownerships. What is most notable is how the headlines in the Cape Times regularly attack the Democratic Alliance, the opposition party. These are the front page leads with big headlines about the leader of the opposition in the Cape, the premier of the province, Helen Zilla, and her spooks, her spies, and that story which didn't seem to stand up to the degree that they did it. There was a perception by Miss Helen Ziele and her DA in the Western Cape that the Cape Times in particular were not going to report favorably anymore. What she did 
She threatened the Cape Times to withdraw her government subscription to that particular paper. Now, that was a blatant attempt to muzzle the Cape Times. While South African newspapers are agenda setters, their reach pales in comparison to the state-owned broadcaster, the SABC, where critics say the ANC doesn't just have a grip, but a stranglehold. There have been eight CEOs under Zuma, averaging one a year. The current chief operating officer, Claudie Mutsuneng, reportedly gave journalists a 70% happy news quota ahead of the general election in 2014, stories that would help get the ruling party re-elected. And last month, the network banned live phone calls on its radio talk shows, apparently because too many callers were critical of the government and its leadership. The SABC has denied that claim. We do see on the SABC uh, editorial decisions that seem to come out of the blue, outside of the formal editorial decision-making structure. Guests are pulled out of talk shows, programs are cancelled, there's a refusal to screen documentaries that are critical of the state and the ruling party. The public broadcast is just one particular example of state capture of media institutions. At the same time, there is a threat to media organizations. Journalists are intimidated all the time by politicians. Journalists are obstructed in their work. And so it's really important for media practitioners, for journalists, for media activists, for freedom of expression activists, to sort of guard what we have very, very closely. The media are one of the few institutions that are still able to hold power to account in South Africa. But with Jacob Zuma and his government feeling the pressure in Parliament... For you, Honourable President, are not an honourable man. ...on the streets... ...and even at home, the media are being pushed to toe the line. And while some news outlets in the age of Zuma can be bought with the carrot, those who rebel could face the stick. In the process of putting together that report, we contacted both the South African government and the SABC to get their comments, but neither got back to us. However, the New Age newspaper and independent media did respond. The New Age told us that the paper is, quote, broadly supportive of the government. However, our journalists are independent and critical, and our position may change with changes in government. Regarding the revenues from state advertising, the paper spokesman said the amount is not a significant percentage of their total ad income. He also clarified that the SABC retains all the ad revenue from the breakfast briefings. At Independent Media, the chief content officer, Karima Brown, took issue with the basis of our story. On specifics, she said the investment of government pension funds into the company had no significant meaning since state funds are invested in other media companies as well. She also denied that the Cape Times or any other affiliated titles report negatively on the opposition. Finally, as we said earlier in the show, Donald Trump's rallies are getting tougher for journalists to handle. But that hasn't had any impact on the volume of media coverage that he's getting. According to a study published in the New York Times, Trump's media coverage outstrips not only his Republican rivals, but all the candidates combined. The New York Times has valued the coverage at nearly $2 billion. That's airtime and column inches that have been garnered purely off the bank of Trump's outrageous statements, talking about how he wins at everything, mocking his competitors, and slamming immigrants and Muslims. The media are regular targets as well, so we looked through footage of Trump's rallies and debates to put together this compilation of Trump's thoughts on the media in his own words. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Donald Trump is still driving the campaign debate, still leading big in the polls, still smacking the media around. Spin the camera! Don't ask me questions like that. You're not a very good reporter doing that. That's a typical case of the press with misinterpretation. And every week I go up, 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 up. And every week these idiots on television say, well, I think he's peaked now. Written by a nice reporter. Now the poor guy, you got to see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Ah, oh, I don't remember. And they do get good ratings for these speeches. The media is sort of going nuclear on you. Campbell Brown for NBC and CNN anchor. Let's stop being complicit in promoting his hateful and harmful demagoguery. Ben, you know what's interesting about Campbell Brown? For years I haven't heard of her name.
I didn't even know she was still alive, but I guess she is. You're going to find out about the media someday, folks. They are the worst. By the way, I hate some of these people, but I'd never kill them. I hate them. I'll be honest. I would never kill them. No, I wouldn't. Then I'll tell you something. What's really going to be fun? I'm right now suing Univision for $500 million, and I want to tell you, we're going to win a lot of money because of what they're doing.